Good afternoon. I'm Alex White, Chair of the IIEA's Energy Group, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this event, which is part of the lecture series Rethink Energy, uh, brought to you by the ESB and the IIEA. And on behalf of the IIEA, I would like to thank the ESB for their continuing support and generous uh, sponsorship of this series. This seminar will explore the potential of the European hydrogen economy. Hydrogen is expected to play an important role uh, in achieving a carbon neutral economy in Europe by 2050. And while currently representing a modest fraction of the global uh, energy mix, projections indicate that clean hydrogen could meet approximately 25% of the world's energy demand by mid-century. And of course, green hydrogen also has many possible applications in the Irish context, as it does um, across, across the world. Today, we've convened a distinguished panel of experts to hear their assessments of the role that hydrogen could play in the transition to a clean and secure energy future. Today's event, just to say briefly about the event itself, lasts for around 70 minutes or so. Shortly, I'm going to invite each of our three panelists to uh, offer some introductory uh, remarks. Um, then we'll have a brief panel discussion amongst um, our distinguished uh, guests before turning most importantly then to your questions. Um, and we really encourage your contributions um, you can join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you'll see there on your screen. And feel free to send in your questions throughout the session as they occur to you. It's always a hazard that questions, really good questions, all come together towards the end and we just can't get to them because, you know, we just have to wrap up at some point. So once something occurs to you, just put the question in then and the sooner it comes in, the, the better a chance there is that we'll actually uh, reach it. And I would ask you, if you don't mind, to identify yourself um, when you put the question in and your affiliation, um, if you have one, when you, uh, when, when you do that. So a reminder that the event, the whole event, is on the record, and um, you can join the discussion on Twitter if you're motivated uh, to do so, and you could use the hashtag, which is hashtag Rethink Energy. First, though, before we um, introduce our uh, panellists, I'm delighted to hand over to Jim Dollard, Executive Director of Generation and Trading at the ESB, and Jim will offer some opening remarks. Jim, over to you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon, and you're all very welcome to what will be, I hope, a very exciting uh, seminar today. Um, ESB has worked really closely with the IEA for, for a number of years now, but in particular the Rethink Energy series. I think this afternoon's discussion in particular is a tremendous fit with rethinking energy. Um, just this week, ESB has announced a new corporate strategy in a similar vein. Its focus is net zero by 2040, which is a tremendous target and one we all need to deliver with. I think when you talk about uh, net zero, Ireland has tremendous uh, natural resources in terms of renewables, particularly off the West Coast, and they will bring emissions down. We will make big steps. Ultimately, however, solving intermittency of wind will be a final piece in the jigsaw of net zero. Um, long term storage is essential to deliver that. And we believe green hydrogen will be a key aspect of that solution. Since 2019, as a result, we've been advocating hydro hydrogen as a storage solution, green hydrogen as a storage solution for Ireland in particular. And ESB is intent on playing its part on driving that capability for Ireland. As part of our overall strategy now, um, we see hydrogen as a key plank. In 2021, we announced Green Atlantic, um, which is a plan to repurpose Money Point, which is a coal-fired station, which has been the cornerstone of the Irish electricity system for about 40 years. So it's particularly, I suppose, symbolic. We see ourselves repurposing that site as a green energy hub. Uh, that process or that transition has already started, but the key pieces are a 1200 megawatt floating offshore wind farm, which we believe will be in place partially before the end of the decade. And in partnership with that, a major hydrogen production and storage hub. Work has commenced and we believe that vision can be delivered in the timeframes of 2030 and beyond. We're also developing another lighthouse, a number of lighthouse projects, projects that will take us there in terms of our vision for hydrogen. 
they're across a range of areas. One obvious one that I'll call out is we will build an electrolyzer on one of our wind farms in the coming years. We are partnering with companies like Decarbon X in terms of large scale storage. And we are working with a number of partners in terms of transport. How can we put transport solutions that are hydrogen based into operation in our economy? It's exciting times. Uh, we believe that green hydrogen will be a critical part of the energy landscape in terms of net zero, but also in terms of security of supply. We have a tremendous, to conclude, we have a tremendous panel today. So without further ado, I'll hand over for, for what I know will be a really informative lecture. Um, great to have you with us uh, as always. Um, so now to turn to our first speaker, Dr. Isabel Cabrita is Professor of Energy Solutions at the Institute of Education and Sciences in Lisbon. She also serves as a researcher at Serena, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, a Portuguese research and technological development institute which spe specializes in innovative and sustainable energy solutions. From 2015 to 2021, she was head of the Research Directorate General of Energy and Geology in Portugal. In this role, Dr. Cabrita oversaw the implementation of the Portuguese Energy and Climate Plan and Portugal's National Hydrogen Strategy, which we're very interested to hear something about this afternoon. Dr. Cabrita has produced more than 300 publications and served as guest editor of an edition of Energies in 2021. So, Isabel, the floor is yours. Very welcome. Thank you. Well, uh, well, first of all, thank you. And uh, I would like to thank the Institute uh, of International and European Affairs for the invitation. and. Uh, the opportunity to, to share my knowledge and the experience I had with the Portuguese hydrogen strategy. Uh, I would like to start by referring uh, to the flexibility that uh, hydrogen can offer to the energy system. It can be used in various sectors and uh, also serves as uh, an energy vector that goes into different products and uh, serve as energy storage, as was actually stated before, and provides or can provide clean solutions in the context of a circular economy. And this will uh, contribute to meet the sustainability goals in the future and also to strengthen the economy. I think it's a very important uh, uh, factor that I think should be considered when we are discussing hydrogen with its advantages and disadvantages. In the case of Portugal, we have uh, very favorable conditions to develop a hydrogen economy. We have a, a modern natural gas infrastructure that can be used to introduce hydrogen. We have very competitive prices related to uh, electricity generation from renewable sources, and also its a geographical location that facilitates business in terms of exports, and also the use of water to produce hydrogen. And I think very, in a way, similar to the conditions of uh, Ireland. So taking this uh, strategy was designed to promote an industrial policy around hydrogen. And uh, with the definition of a set of public policies, which could drive public and private investment at all levels and from production to consumption of uh, hydrogen. And together with this, we actually associated renewable uh, gases. And I think that what, that is an important uh, fa uh, fact because we, didn't only focus on the hydrogen production, but also in either types of gases uh, through hydrogen, and uh, uh, that also in a way promoted the projects uh, based on hydrogen. The instruments we had in the European context were the carbon neutrality roadmap, 
uh, and the National Energy and Climate Plan and the National Investment Plan that focus uh, mostly in large structuring projects. With these, we designed the national hydrogen strategy, and this in support of the energy and climate plan and carbon neutrality to make it easier even to meet the targets that were set up in a faster way. Uh, three phases were uh, decided for the implementation of this strategy. Phase one for a three year period uh, until 23, uh, it, uh, we focus on uh, regulatory measures and pilot projects to be set up. Then on the second phase until 2030 and supporting the energy climate plan uh, to consolidate and implement larger national projects. And the phase three until 2050 for full development of a national hydrogen market. And this, of course, uh, was with the definition of uh, various targets in different sectors that uh, are stated in the slide in terms of uh, greenhouse gases and the percentage of introduction of hydrogen in different sectors. And, was projected a value of investment from seven to nine billion euros. A framework to enable the implementation of this strategy was designed and starting by the legal and the regulatory framework as the all the legislation that uh, existed in Portugal was based on fossil fuels. So, this had to be adapted and revised to be able to include green hydrogen uh, for its production, storage production, uh, the transportation and distribution. Then based on the fact that we have a high installed renewable energy source production capacity that we could even uh, enhance this by promoting smaller projects, even going into a higher consumption at the domestic level. So uh, promoting uh, the funding of uh, smaller and pilot projects focusing on industry, but not only. And this was introduced into the strategy plan together with other renewable gases so that uh, would enable the, let's say the introduction of hydrogen in a faster way and in a more acceptable way. It was also defined the target for electrolyzer capacity of 2.5 gigawatt, but uh, the, uh, larger projects starting with 10 megawatt installations was defined and this would be set up at the regional level and assisted by dedicated installations using wind and solar energy. In the case of solar energy, we were uh, taking advantage of the conditions, the Portuguese con conditions that uh, actually we have um, uh, uh, let's say an incidence in terms of solar energy that is the uh, highest uh, in Europe. In terms of uh, promoting uh, these projects uh, and uh, uh, setting up the market, we uh, auctions were also designed uh, to on hydrogen production and storage to temporarily support operating costs. So not only the CAPEX, but the OPEX. And I think this is very important uh, issue because uh, uh, in this, uh, discussions with industry, industry showed that this was a very sensitive uh, point and that it should be enabled and something done uh, at this level. We, uh, we introduced the a revision of standards and the certification schemes, and also looking into guarantees of origin 
uh, focusing on green hydrogen and other renewable gases. And one important point that was introduced at the strategy was the importance of research to include research and innovation to strengthen national competencies that exist and that could enable even the technology development and some capacity building in this context so that uh, Portugal could uh, uh, drive uh, some uh, new technologies to and uh, contribute to this. And the collaborative laboratory on hydrogen was launched where there is a, a very significant participation of private companies, universities and research centers, national and international level, and mon monitoring of the implementation of this uh, strategy was also considered with the creation of a task force. Very briefly, I just speak about the CNES, Digital and Hydrogen Valley, which is a, a hub uh, for production and consumption of hydrogen. It has a good location and drives, uh, uh, let's say, the potential for uh, large production of hydrogen, as well as the possibility of having exports and to be a lever also of, for the creation of a national hydrogen strategy. And in case of the concept, the strategy uh, focus uh, all, as I said, all uh, levels from production to end use. I would like to stress here the fact that we are not only focusing on the production of hydrogen with electrolysis from grid surplus or dedicated installations, but also biomass gasification and taking advantage of even potential uh, use in the future of results in terms of research of uh, algal biomass or other type of processes to contribute to the production of hydrogen and in a way to strengthen the national competence and, uh, to this level. As final comments, I would like to put some uh, issues that come from the experience I had with uh, this strategy and to start with the engagement of all sectors and stakeholders right from the beginning. It, we had various meetings and uh, workshops. Uh, it is very important that uh, you, you engage uh, all uh, stakeholders in order to to accept this change because you have to change into a different system the second point is public policies and regulation uh, need to address uh, different issues and this leads to different ministries and entities to be involved which uh, needs a, a lot of coordination and articulation to, to have some uh, uh, efficacy when you implement the strategy so that everything is uh, uh, goes into place. The third aspect I would like to address is to guarantee an integrated regulatory framework to include tax and incentive measures that are necessary for development of infrastructures should have a adequate robust network all components should be addressed at all level standards investment all sorts and also the level of technology is that offered to consumers and consider the consumers that they have in uh, technologies that are efficient and are also affordable and this is very important because you can have something but then people cannot take and this should be in, uh, included in the strategy research and innovation 
to strengthen national competencies should be included in the plan of action, because this also will drive uh, education and capacity building and also contribute to the advances of this transition and even advance the hydrogen economy. And last, uh, knowledge and experience exchange from uh, through international cooperation that some is not only staying inside but going outside sharing like we are now sharing experiences and uh, in, it should uh, there should be uh, uh, a room for uh, international cooperation even in terms of think tank and i would like to uh, acknowledge and comment the uh, strategy uh, regarding the institute of international and european affairs on this that is uh, actually promoting this discussion and i think it's very important that this is taken internationally and for instance at the uh, european level i think it's very important discussions between the member states to see what are the uh, what member states can offer in terms of uh, positive aspects ones are offering hydrogen even others they don't have this capacity but can receive so that an overall market can be established taking uh, uh, the, the characteristics and the different uh, uh, i'm trying to find the english <laughs> word for values of each member state that can contribute into this uh, uh, European uh, strategy. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much um, uh, for that um, and for your insights, um, Isabel, and also, you know, the experience of Portugal, um, which is, as you make the point that we have a lot countries have a lot to learn from each other. It's really, it, it's, it's great to hear um, those points and those insights. Um, and we'll come back to you in a few minutes um, for, for the discussion. Another country that has led the way and that has a um, hydrogen strategy, established one, um, is Germany. And we're delighted um, this afternoon to be joined by Franz Lehner. Uh, I nearly said Franz Lehner, uh, I'm sorry. Fra Franz Lehner, um, Head of International Cooperation at NOW. Um, the German organization for hydrogen and fuel cell technology. NOW is responsible for the coordination and management of the German innovation program for hydrogen and fuel cell technology and the electromobility model regions program uh, of the Federal Ministry of Transport and Digital Infrastructure of Germany. An engineer by training, Mr. Lehner has more than 10 years of professional experience focusing on hydrogen fuel cells, renewable fuels, and electric mobility. Before joining NOW in early 2021, Mr. Lehner was managing consultant at the International Energy Transition consulting firm E4 Tech in Lausanne in Switzerland. From 2014 to 2019, he co-authored the annual fuel cell industry review published by E4 Tech, the global benchmark report uh, for the sector. So, Franz, you're more than welcome this afternoon, and we look forward to hear what you have to say. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alex, for this kind introduction. It's an honor to be on this panel today. Um, I hope you can see my screen because I can't see the video right now. So unless I hear anything different, I continue. Um, so today I tried to capture um, a few topics in a relatively short um, presentation. So briefly a few words on NOW, who we are, what we do, and then a bit on the broader picture um, about hydrogen in reaching net zero by 2050 on a, on a global um, energy transition picture, and then concluding with the latest policy developments um, in Germany for hydrogen. So briefly about NOW, it's the National Organization for Hydrogen Fuel Cell Technology, originally founded for that purpose um, to coordinate the National Innovation Program for Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Technologies. Um, but meanwhile, we are also having a number of other 
funding programs uh, in our portfolio. So we are fully owned by the federal government and only get our assignments directly from ministries at the federal level. And beyond um, hydrogen fuel cells, what's very important to mention is also we are responsible for rolling out the national charging infrastructure in Germany for battery electric vehicles and in the future also heavy duty battery electric vehicles. So I say this um, especially because um, I know there are sometimes quite heated discussions on one or the other options. Um, the good thing is we have both of those technologies in, in our portfolio and very healthy discussions also internally on what are the pros and cons of each option. Um, I would like to emphasize right at the start, uh, hydrogen works. So the technology is beyond the R&D stage today which should not say we don't need to continue doing research and development to improve it. Of course, we should do that, but um, we don't have to wait for breakthrough innovations to get started with deploying hydrogen and fuel cell technology. Um, we at NOW, we support funding programs for um, using hydrogen in transport applications. So this is a snapshot of where we are currently in Germany, around 100 refueling stations across the country. Um, so with a fuel cell vehicle, you can basically um, drive across Germany today and um, with around 1,500 vehicles on the road, mostly cars at the moment. But we've also, of course, funded a number of uh, research and development projects and um, continue to do so as part of the second phase of the National Innovation Program. So for transport, hydrogen may be a bit more recent and a bit of a more new approach. But hydrogen generally is an industrial commodity that has been used for, for decades um, and also transported on an industrial scale. So if you compare it on a global picture, the, the problem is really how we produce hydrogen today. So uh, the emissions of producing hydrogen are basically corresponding with the emissions of the av aviation sector today. Um, so it's not hydrogen that we need to tackle, it's how we make hydrogen that we need to tackle. Um, in our international corporations at NOW, we have over the years established ourselves as a representative of Germany in this technology field. Um, so we are involved in multilateral initiatives such as mission innovation, um, the IPHE, the IEA hydrogen technology collaboration program, and trying to bring here um, the, the right actors together to move forward on the standards and regulation side, which is important so we can share products across different countries um, and also on financing for the early market ramp up. I, I'll get to that later in a, in a little bit more detail. Now about the role of hydrogen in reaching net zero. I'd like to start with a relatively um, bold statement that 100% um, renewable energy system by mid-century globally is feasible. There are enough studies that have looked at how much materials does it require, how much land area, how much water does it require. So it's not that it's not known that it's possible. It's more about the question, do we actually want to get there? And uh, will we put in the right measures to, to get on that journey? Um, obviously, we have to deal with the legacy technology, fossil fuels. Uh, and so the transition gets, it gets quite complicated in some places. But the speed of transition is really key because we have only 28 years left to mid-century. For Germany, we have tightened the target. So we want to be climate neutral already by 2045, which is not really far away and so on the supply side i think the all options are important versus the what are the fastest options we can deploy is is an important question and we know that solar and wind have scaled up dramatically over the last 20 years so they've proven they are able to grow with 20 percent per year um, and so we should on the supply side not worry too much that's the, the good thing actually we know how to get there um, but we should not get distracted with too many options um, on the table. Beyond 2050, it's maybe another ball game, but for, for the next 30 years, I think we should focus on, on what we have today in our toolbox and use those wisely. If we then move to 100% renewable energy system, storage is of course very important because as we all know, the wind doesn't blow all the time and in the night, um, it's hard to run a heat pump with the solar, solar panel. So underground gas storage is, is key here. And the first step from getting from electrons from wind and solar to molecules is hydrogen. You can turn this hydrogen in other derivatives, um, but the easiest in the longer term picture would be to just uh, use hydrogen as is, as a replacement for natural gas, and then use that also in natural gas power plants to 
um, to seasonal balancing, but also maybe uh, more short-term balancing. I'd like to conclude this slide with one important point that we will have to replace fossil fuels, not just in the electricity sector, but also for industrial use cases, the so-called hard to abate applications. And um, we're getting very interesting questions here in the chat. One debate that's also in Germany very prominent these days is where should we use green hydrogen? Should we use it only for those sectors where we don't have any other options to decarbonize? Or can it also be used in transport, in building, in heating buildings, etc.? Um, and I think um, if you're talking about using green hydrogen for industrial uses, we are working on the assumption that we'll get it cheap enough to be a broadly available commodity at the expenses of, of fossil fuels today. Otherwise, we would have to subsidize our industrial sector forever to be um, CO2 neutral. So the target should be getting hydrogen so cheap that it's really broadly available and um, not have the same mistake as we had in the 90s and 80s, where we always said, Renewables will always be expensive from solar and wind, so we have to firstly reduce the demand and have efficiency measures in place before we can move to renewables. No, the reality today is renewables are the cheapest source of electricity, and now the challenge is to make in the next 20 years renewable hydrogen the cheapest form of molecular energy carriers. And so the question is, um, will we get there in time? Can electrolyzer technology scale quick enough to where we need to get them by 2050 or mid-century, around 10 terawatt hours of electrolyzer capacity? Today, um, we are manufacturing less than about 100 megawatts per year. So it's a huge upscaling that we have to get done in the next 20 years from tens of gigawatts to hundreds of gigawatts between 2030 and 2040. But the good thing is this has been done in the last 20 years for PV, so we know it's possible and the pressure on climate policy is much stronger today than it was in the early 2000s. So the framework conditions are in place. Then the question comes often, is the electrolyzer industry ready to scale so fast? And here we have conducted a study already in 2017 and 18, um, looking very detailed on what it takes to manufacture electrolyzers and the critical components that go into electrolyzers. And for making five gigawatts a year, um, which would be in the horizon around 2030 and beyond for Germany, we came to the conclusion that it actually just takes, for most of the components, a full-sized industrial manufacturing line. Um, so it's, it's, it's really um, no rocket science. We just have to have the right program in place to scale it up very quickly in the next years. Um, and the good thing is also we have a pool of different technologies on the electrolysis side, so we are not dependent on just one approach. And last slide on, on the global picture, I um, would like to touch on the discussion blue versus green hydrogen. Um, blue hydrogen is quite often mentioned as a bridge into a future where we ultimately reach green hydrogen. Um, and that's maybe also a topic for, for, the, for the next talk by, by Shiva about the financing of green hydrogen projects. The challenging thing here is that they are have very high upfront costs because you have to invest in the wind uh, or in the solar power plant, then also in the electrolyzer. But then once it's all running, there are very little costs. Uh, that's quite the opposite with fossil fuels or bioenergy. Um, but the, the good thing is that you know all your costs at the beginning. So for the entire project lifetime, you are secure, you, you have all the factors under control. With blue hydrogen, it's quite the opposite. So you have little, uh, you have less cost upfront, but then you're exposed to a lot of risks, such as price vol um, volatility of the natural gas sector, something which has been overlooked in recent years, but has become very prominent recently um, with the energy crisis. And um, then also regulatory risks, such as methane leakage. How will those le uh, methane emissions be accounted for in future regulations? What price will they have to someone who runs a project? And also the abatement of the remaining CO2 emissions. So blue hydrogen with CO2 capture will usually not capture 100% of the emissions because that would be very, very expensive to capture the last few percentage points. And uh, then you don't know how much abatement cost will those remaining emissions be. In a net zero world, you would have to abate them with some negative emission technologies at some point. So there's a risk that you end up with stranded assets uh, with blue hydrogen um, over the investment cycle. And so I would argue that um, that is a strong uh, factor for, um, for green hydrogen in investment decisions as soon as it's becoming large scale. So I'm looking forward to, to probably have some, some questions and discussions around these topics uh, afterwards. And now a brief 
um, brief statement on, on Germany. So we have done um, also this exercise uh, that Isabel described for Portugal with establishing a national hydrogen strategy in 2020. Also a lengthy process to get alignment and agreement with all the different ministries. And uh, I can only support that it's very important also to involve the stakeholders at, at the industry level, at the research level, um, to get all these, these done. But I think it helps to have this central document um, which defined a number of measures and has also provided quite a good um, stimulus package for supporting it. Two billion euros going into international hydrogen topics. Um, part of this is, for example, the so-called H2 global program, where Germany will, um, will cover the difference between the production costs for green hydrogen today and the price being paid on the market in Germany for um, green hydrogen that is being brought from outside of Europe to Germany or Europe, um, probably in the first phase through derivatives of hydrogen and then the longer term was as, as pure hydrogen. Now that was in 2020, as some of you might know, we have a new government from um, December almost last year. And um, they have pledged in their coalition treaty that they will continue the hydrogen strategy, have a, an update to that, um, which we are expecting in 2022. And the coalition treaty suggests that the approach on hydrogen will be even more ambitious. For example, the electrolyzer target um, for deployment has been doubled from previously 5 gigawatts by 2030 to now 10 gigawatts by 2030. Um, and they've also commented in the treaty that they would take in the near term a technology agnostic view on regulation. So not prescribing everything, not to kill the momentum now in the startup phase, which is very critical. Um, and um, also support technologies such as fuel cells, etc. Um, you can derive from the statement that that um, technologies will also be supported, even if green hydrogen is not yet broadly available immediately, because it takes some time to do that ramp up. So I'd like to conclude with a statement from our Chancellor Olaf Scholz recently, just a week ago, where he said, we will transform our economy for the most part, where gas is necessary, to a hydrogen-based one. And that will be a process which will happen much faster than some may think, but which will create a great future for all of us. So I underlined the happen much faster than some may think. I think we have all the tools that we need to get this transition done as quick as we have to, to get to net zero by 2050. We just have to get started. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, Franz for that um, intervention, um, which is so informative and interesting. And I'm sure there's lots of stuff that we, people want to come back on. I know certainly that I, I, I do. And there is um, early activity on the Q&A function. So please, um, if you're watching and listening and a question or comment occurs to you, uh, put it in there on the Q&A. Um, keep it as succinct as you feel you can. Um, Give us a chance to read it so we can turn it around and, and actually put the question so um it's it's great that people are taking interest and there's you know there are hundreds of people on this call um now which is which is terrific um so um turning to our third um speaker shiva dustar is head of innovation finance advisory at the european investment bank a leading innovation finance expert with over 25 years um, experience at JP Morgan, uh, Fitch Ratings, and now um, at the European Investment Bank. Uh, Shiva specializes in identifying future investment opportunities and developing new business and market opportunities um, to finance the transition to a green uh, and digital economy. She co-founded the European High Yield Association, EYEHYA, which is now part of the Association uh, for Financial Markets in Europe. In 2006, Shiva was listed in the top 50 women in credit by Credit Magazine. Uh, you didn't know that, did you not? <laughs> um, Ms. Dustar holds a BA in economics from Columbia University in New York and an executive MBA from London Business School. So Shiva, we're delighted to have you with us this afternoon and really looking forward to what you have to say. Over to you. Thank you very much, Alex, and uh, thank you to the IIEA for inviting the EIB and myself to this really important uh, session of Rethinking Energy. Uh, so really happy to be here. Um, I may ask for my slides indeed to show up. I 
wanted to ensure that the connection stayed stable. So I appreciate if, uh, if somebody can help me uh, passing through those slides. So the European Investment Bank, and if we could maybe move to the next slide, indeed. I hope you have all heard of the EIB, otherwise you are really missing out. Um, and uh, this is maybe your time to, to quickly uh, get familiarized with the European Investment Bank. And I would say the EIB group, this also includes the EIF. So you see here right now, um, actually the numbers that were released um, in our annual press conference just a few weeks ago. So we're hitting almost 100 billion on the group level, um, so EIB and EIF included, um, and you see that we are very much uh, sort of, you know, coming in all the key priority areas of innovation, environment, infrastructure, and SMEs. Now, what is really, I think, important to remember is that the bank has now the ambition um, and is really working towards to becoming the EU climate bank. I mean, this is quite an important step, I think, to also preserve the EU leadership. I think we had some really excellent presentations from Portugal, from Isabel, uh, on Portugal, from France, on Germany. I mean, I think Europe can really um, uh, work on that leadership and the EIB, both in its activities in the EU and outside, uh, plans to play an important role on the financing. So we are, um, we have put to ourselves to um, mobilize with our investments a trillion euros into climate action and environmental sustainability in this crucial decade to increase our own share uh, of financing dedicated to these two activities to 50% by 2025. And in 2021, we were already at 43%. So I think we are getting there, um, but it is indeed an, an important um, also reshifting of our business activities because there are clearly things that we no longer can finance uh, with this very sort of strong commitment. And this is also the third a bullet point, which is um, that we have, as of actually last year, um, aligned all our financing activities with the principles and the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, hence, you know, with the 50% that we uh, may not, that may not go into climate action, or envi environmental sustainability, they at least don't do any harm. Um, so next slide, please. Now, this is just to give you a bit of a retrospective of the sort of financing that has happened. I think what is actually going to be quite interesting is how it will accelerate and, 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 and you know, gain in size and momentum if we now look forward. So if we took the same four or five year period, you know, in the next five years, I think you will see much bigger numbers just because of our huge commitments to really, um, you know, uh, actively support um, climate action, environmental sustainability. Just to give you a sense on the adaptation front alone, we're planning to triple our activity to 15%. So um, now, hydrogen, and I think if we could move to the next slide, please, will play an really important role. Um, and I think the hydrogen economy is actually going to be quite a capital intensive one as, as much as we do have perhaps some of the technologies, I think we will, uh, certainly our view is that quite a lot of the infrastructure uh, needs in order to really uh, get hydrogen across the whole value chain and get the full impact of hydrogen in decarbonizing our industries, our transport systems will require massive investments. And this is really where we believe at the EIB that we actually do have um, you know, the right set of instruments. It's just that they do need to now perhaps be tweaked and ensure that we take the right risk appetite um, and, and use them therefore to support the investment needs. So here you see basically that we are they, you know, effectively together with our subsidiary operating across the public private uh, sectors, across the various instruments. Um, and uh, as we will see shortly, you know, in the, in the case of hydrogen, I would say we will need to deploy all of them, but where we perhaps see some of the gaps are indeed in this rather risk sharing blending type because of some of the particularities of right now, the hydrogen economy. So next slide, please. And um, again, looking at therefore these instruments, um, you will see on the left-hand side, sort of this, this famous valley of death uh, that is very often referred to. 
where we see some of the very interesting hydrogen uh, technology solutions that are being um, that are coming to market. They often require, nevertheless, this critical um, amount of capital at a stage where they are not considered to be bankable. So the typical traditional commercial bank may not be able to come and finance them. Uh, the equity may be exhausted. And at this stage in this valley, you know, very often we're looking at 10 to 30, 40 million euros, nevertheless, to get them to the commercial demonstration scale. That's where the gap is. And that's where we have a really important financing instrument called the Innofin Energy Demo Project which actually is a risk sharing instrument between the European Investment Bank and the Commission to precisely support these projects. So you see on the right hand side, a number of these projects, some in hydrogen, some um, you know, in, in clean tech more broadly, where indeed this instrument has been extremely powerful. And we'll see some examples later on. Next slide, please. Now, there is also advisory. I'm of course representing the advisory side, but I think when it comes to hydrogen, what we see is that currently looking at our own pipeline, quite, of, quite a number of projects are not yet bankable or they're not yet in a situation where they can actually go straight into due diligence and have you know, a check uh, and, uh, coming their way in the next six months, let's say. Uh, and the reason for that is that we will see it later on, but indeed there's either the risk element or the wider value chain that is not properly set up in order to actually um, you know, address all the various risks that, uh, that would be, um, that need to be addressed in order to make a particular project bankable. So therefore the advisory is playing a, a very important role. Uh, and I would say it comes in both at the upstream project preparation level and here we are uh, fortunate to actually have some very interesting new initiatives by the European Commission that you may have heard of, the Innovation Fund. These are the proceeds of the ETS mechanism that are now flowing into um, innovative technologies. There are calls uh, that the Innovation Fund um, is, you know, has um, underway and both large projects and small projects. What we are doing at the EIB is that for those projects that are not immediately ready to get the benefit of the grants from the Innovation Fund, they get then project development assistance, either of technical nature or of financial advisory nature. The financial advisory part is handled by my own team and we actually see that a large uh, part of the Innovation Fund projects that are in our current portfolio are hydrogen related. So I think this is therefore, um, you know, there is a, a high demand for such projects to benefit from the innovation fund. And to us, this is also giving a sense of direction that those are the projects that we hope to then finance in the future with our other various financing instruments. Um, you see that sort of the current type of projects are very interesting. So on the one hand, we have the typical sort of uh, technology, innovative technology type projects in the electrolyzer space, um, then looking at sort of these giga factories that are right now being uh, looked at the high deal. It has recently also gotten some very interesting press attention. So we are providing sort of this downstream financing advice to these type of projects. Uh, Fra France may know of the work we did with uh, Germany on uh, uh, looking at PPP models for the next sort of a set of hydrogen refueling stations uh, to be financed beyond the hundred and, and how sort of, you know, the chicken egg, the famous chicken egg of um, uh, getting the financing for a network before you have all the, you know, trucks and the cars on the road, how that could be established. So these are the type of projects that we are seeing uh, in our advisory portfolio and very much also feeding into our uh, lending portfolio. Next slide, please. Um, just therefore, as a summary, the way our advisory is set up, we provide this sort of project specific advice. And, and as I said, in, in the hydrogen space, that portfolio is actually growing up, you know, nicely. And the key is to get these products into the due diligence phase. We, however, have seen that with hydrogen is actually really important to take a wider approach. And um, this we have done together with the European Commission, who have asked us to actually um, you know, reach out to the wider investor community to better to better understand how the how they perceive. And when I say they, these are both financial and 
corporate investors, how they perceive the um, hydrogen economy, where they see the risks and where they would like to see the public sector come in. Um, so I will briefly give you some highlights of that work in a, in a minute. Um, we do so also in the hydrogen space uh, in very close collaboration with the various hydrogen associations that uh, are around, in particular Hydrogen Council, Hydrogen Europe, and also on a national level with the French Association. We have uh, also recently uh, been engaged with some other national um, associations. The key here is for us to not have only good access to a potential deal flow, but to also help those associations have a better understanding of the bankability issues so that they can um, help their members to have not only a good understanding of what it takes you know, to be bankable and you know, finance, but also where to come to uh, for the, the level of support that they need. So this is therefore, in, in a sense, for us, an important approach through advisor to have a good holistic understanding of, of the space that is also quite dynamic to have a um, sort of hand on the pulse. And, um, and then prepare in a way the EIB to have the right financing instruments and also the right uh, internal capacity to actually handle the projects. Next slide, please. Now, briefly giving you an uh, insight into our study that I mentioned that was a request by European Commission. It will actually be launched end of uh, March. So the audience here gets a glimpse of what is not yet sort of publicly out there. So this, there's a benefit to being on, on this uh, session today. Uh, this is basically what we did is we reached out to um, 46 corporate and financial investors. You see on the uh, right-hand side of the, the distribution of the type of investors uh, along the whole value chain of um, hydrogen and also geographically. Of course, there was a very strong focus on Europe, but we um, really also try to nevertheless uh, reach out to some Asian and, and, uh, and non-European investors to get also global perspective. Next slide, please. Now, our study basically then, or our, our market you know, outreach, um, highlighted where investors see the key risks. And I, would, and I don't think any of them will surprise you per se. And I think it's more, what are we going to do about these risks? And how will the EIB together with the commission and other public sector institutions actually help to um, un, you know, unblock and, and mitigate these, these risks so that actually these projects become bankable. So you will see that they are in the three categories of economic risks and, and, and also regular, sort of the first point of market regulatory conditions. We heard earlier about the green premium, about initiatives like H2 Global, which are going to be quite critical. Um, that regulatory clarity is extremely important, I think, for a lot of investors. Um, and they're still looking for, for you know, more clarity to come and more standardization to follow. Uh, looking at it from a more sort of specific access to finance perspective, when you look at the whole value chain, there are um, certainly there is more risk capital needed in in the space that I mentioned earlier with some of the technological solutions, but actually downstream, you will have also risks that are more standard project finance risks, just because of the way the dynamic works, you may not have, even if you have offtake agreements, they may not have the same tenor that is required, uh, you know, they may not have the same tenor as a loan that is may, may be required. So we see that there is actually an important role that public sector uh, banks and, and also entities generally can play to mitigate some of these key deployment risks. And then this whole value chain approach is actually increasingly viewed by um, the wider investor community as being critical. And this is where we hope that also the EIB will play a role in bringing the wider eco, you know, system together and, and better understand really in a more dynamic way, not just through a one-off outreach, how, um, how these sort of risks are shifting and how it can play an important role going forward. Next slide, please. Now here, just a few examples of projects that we have financed before. These are primarily sort of on the more higher risk element using various uh, sort of um, thematic instruments that we have at Future Mobility and the Energy Demo Project. You see that, uh, you know, the amounts are somewhere between 12 million uh, to 25 million. So we are in that high risk, high 
impact sort of uh, category here. Next slide, please. Then, for instance, an, an interesting project that we financed uh, with a slightly higher amount of 40 million to establish a corridor in, um, you know, in, in, in France that sort of, um, sort of is that green hydrogen corridor. And again, we hope and, and we already see some interest in other parts of Europe for that type of financing. Again, looking at it from a mobility perspective. Next slide, please. And then I guess to conclude, um, as you see that you know, the EIB as a climate bank um, has of course ambitious objectives, hydrogen will be critical uh, for us to not only uh, be the true climate bank, but really also to decarbonize more broadly. Hence, um, you know, we need to uh, make sure that we are uh, keeping a pace with the, the development of the hydrogen economy. We have the financing tools available. We are also well set up um, with the advisory services to help projects to become bankable, to identify them and also have the right financing instruments. So therefore, I guess there's nothing to stop us uh, to, to you know, play the role and uh, really looking forward to an interesting discussion. I think the next slide is just our contact details. Yeah in case you wish to reach out uh, directly to us or through our Innofin advisory mailbox. And with that, I stop. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, they were three superb uh, contributions. Thank you so much, Shiva, for yours and, and, and to each of the speakers. Um, instead of me asking the questions that I had in mind and taking up 10 minutes to do that, I think really we should, you know, we should start looking at the questions that we've got in from our very engaged um, our very engaged uh, audience and actually can I just say they're engaged but so th so are our speakers because our speakers going above and beyond the call of duty are already replying to some of the questions that have come up on the chat on the Q&A and I want to thank them for that um, as I said that was, that's that's more than we asked you to do and it's it's very professional and very decent of you to uh, to start into uh, answering some of those questions specifically that have come in but I'm going to just dip into one of those questions. I think Franz has already been looking at it. So, but it's a, it has a general, it occurs to me as a general question from Raj Tiwari. And it's like, so we've heard the climate bank. Um, we've heard the example of Portugal. We've heard the example of Germany, two countries that actually have established strategies uh, in place. And Raj Tiwari is asking a question. He said, well, if we, if we already have a hydrogen infrastructure in Europe, why are we not sharing it across, I presume he means across Europe, to save time and cost? And now like I said, if we, if we have a developed fuel, fuel cell technology, why are we researching it again? Why can't we imp implement what we have and then work on further research? And my question, I might, what occurs to me is, is there a danger of duplication? Obviously, the conditions for individual countries are different. They'll always be a bit different anyway. But to me, as a lay person in this area, is there a risk that there's duplication, that you know, countries go off and do their own strategy, whereas somebody's already got one. Um, and if they just implemented that one, or at least adopted it to their conditions, that we could move more quickly and achieve what Franz was talking about, which is the speed that we need. Um, so maybe, Isabel, do you have a view about that as to whether, you know, there can be better sharing between uh, uh, countries uh, uh, in, on this whole agenda so that we can save time? Um. Well, as uh, my, in my presentation, actually, I, hmm. I stated that, that there should be more cooperation among countries to, to, to come to agreements, of course. Hmm. But when it comes to, for instance, in the case of uh, fuel cell, and we have been debating that in Portugal, uh, uh, the use of fuel cell when you you kind of store uh, hydrogen or you get the hydrogen from the, the grid and then you store and you use in the fuel cell, uh, there is um, a loss of um, efficiency, you know, the yield. And uh, for instance, we don't uh, um, uh, fund, for example, those projects. Mm. Uh, we put them out uh, of uh, the line not to promote the production of hydrogen to then to be used on, uh, on hydrogen. But I mean, uh, everything has 
to have a solution. And the, I mean, the, the, the conditions are different. So I do agree that even in a, a global policy and in Europe, I really think that uh, uh, countries sh should sit and see what they have and don't have and see how they could contribute, mm -hmm. you know, to have a share on it. Uh, that's my point of view and uh, analyze the situation of each one because they are all different. Hmm. Franz, a view on that? Um, yeah, I tried also to clarify in the chat. So I want to make the point that the infrastructure is working in industrial contexts. So we don't have to reinvent the technology itself. Obviously, we have to build um, hydrogen infrastructure, be it for refueling, but also for transporting hydrogen. That could be through repurposing existing natural gas infrastructure. But we are just at the, at the starting point there in terms of deploying the technology, but we understand how the technology works. That, that is what I wanted to make clear. And um, for, um, yeah, across borders, um, their standards, regulations are very important. So I think having an umbrella at the European level, like the hydrogen strategy from uh, at the European level, but also then um, the Fit for 55 package, which sets the boundary conditions so that that we benefit from from synergies across the different countries. Sheila, yes, and I, from, from yes indeed. I mean, I I would obviously I would concur with what was said, and indeed, um, I think a lot of the products that we see have by nature a cross border dimension. Uh, you know, you have the demand very often in in heavy industries in one part of Europe. You have the the generation of the green hydrogen in a different part. Um, so really, and I think this is what will make the financing um, in some ways complex, but also I think this is why we see certainly at the, as the EU bank that there is an important role that that capital has to play in order to, to take that that sort of more holistic value chain approach, um, you know, in order to get these projects bankable. Um, so I actually, you know, I would say, um, I don't think, you know, you can think in national terms. I mean, energy systems are global. And in fact, it's not even think enough to think of Europe, you know, we will see that there is actually even a dimension with Africa and other places when it comes to hydrogen. Sure. Paul McCormack, um, Thank you for your comment. Hydrogen Ireland fully agree that the focus um, should be on green hydrogen. Plan and invest for a zero carbon future and um, not uh, be investing in blue hydrogen, which is a fossil fuel past. Um, Cormac McKay says that, um, uh, that blue hydrogen um, is greenwashing. Um, and Gavin Blake wonders whether blue hydrogen should be treated with a lot of skepticism given the skepticism, given the claims that the powerful fossil fuel industry is essentially behind it as a means of that industry surviving in the medium to long term. So what, what, does, what do any of you like to say about that, make those distinctions between blue and green and the politics of it, I suppose, as well? Anybody? Shall I start? Yes, <laughs> yes please. Uh, well, what happens is you can't just switch your fingers and you are with hydrogen, you, you really have to have a transition period and blue hydrogen can, uh, can help that. And it, to my view, it, of course you have to plan that and you want to have it as short as possible. Uh, and I think also that one should also consider in terms of uh, uh, even the sequestration of CO2 altogether and uh, try to analyze that in terms of the, the impacts, because there are always impacts, even with green hydrogen, there are impacts. So it is not, you don't have a solution, whatever you do, you are going to uh, disrupt something, but uh, you, you need, to go from one point to the other. And the blue hydrogen probably is uh, a good way to go because you could also consider, as I stated in my presentation, we included biomass gasification and there are the hydrothermal processes with algae and so on, but they are not mature enough 
yet and they are costly and you have to look into the other side if you can afford those technologies mm -hmm. and so uh, I, I would say yes let's go for it in, uh, within a certain term and analyze and see the impact and of course you can look into different scenarios because when it comes to also biomass gasification, the, you have the sustainability and you have to look into, into these things. And the natural gas is available, as uh, Franz put it, we have a network already. So okay. let's minimize it, let's put this way. <laughs> Fieber, I'll go to you next, if you don't mind. And I'll come to Franz then, because I'm going to ask Franz a question which is more specific to Germany, and I'm going to ask him to deal with the two questions together. So, Shiva, on blue and green and everything in between. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't want to really go into the politics of it and so yes, on. Of course, I would yeah. perhaps, uh, you know, I would just perhaps make two comments just to, you know, okay. give a feeling. I mean, EIB um, clearly comes into primarily to areas where there is market failure and 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 where where you know as i mentioned earlier the risks and and uh, you know returns are are imbalanced and therefore i mean i think from a you know even though our energy lending policy guidelines which were updated in 2019 allow us also to support uh, natural gas as a transitional fuel and so on I think the main focus is going to be on green hydrogen because that's where a lot of the, um, you know, th that's what we want to move towards. Um, mm -hmm. From also from a fa market failure perspective, that that's where maybe the harder part of of the the, the puzzle is. Uh, the other thing from a risk perspective, you know, if you come in as a long term lender into, you know, as a patient long term uh, provider of capital you know, the issue of stranded assets uh, is also going to be an important consideration. So I think there are yeah. dynamics, uh, you know, that would probably put our emphasis much more on, on the green um, than anything else. And, and there's plenty of, uh, we, we see plenty of projects that need our capital. Sure, sure. That's interesting. Um, Franz, I'm going to ask you maybe to comment on that, but just while you're thinking about what you might add, uh, Frank Daly, the German-Irish Chamber of Industry and Commerce, uh, Frank says, has established the German-Irish Hydrogen Council to build stronger links between the two countries in the field of green hydrogen. Two questions we're very interested in. What is the most likely form hydrogen will be imported as, for example, ammonia, et cetera? Um, and what is the expected delivered cost to Germany per kilogram? Yeah, uh, very no good. Pressure. No, no pressure, no pressure. Specific question. So uh, I, I think that's uh, worth saying here that we have seen a breadth of studies over the last years that have calculated the cost, the potential cost, currently future cost of green hydrogen. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased that with the H2 Global program, we have now an initiative that is starting hopefully this year with the first auction. Um, system where we will first round of auctions where we will um, actually get real prices what it will cost to make green hydrogen somewhere in the world and bring it to Germany. Um, so so then, then we would have a, a real world data point for the first time. <laughs> um, obviously, in, in a smaller scale, we are doing this today, but um, for, for really thinking about a commoditized mm. approach, we don't have real world data right now. Um, where we have to get to is by 2030, uh, at least in the order of two euros, two dollars per kilogram, ideally lower. The US is even more ambitious there with a one dollar per kilogram target, which brings you in the in the range of, of fossil hydrogen today. Um, so and, and, and all those studies and ambitions have have calculated, is it feasible? And yeah, you have to squeeze out all the little bits and, and you can maybe get there. Um, in terms of which carrier we would um, use um, for H2 Global right now, it's clear it will not be hydrogen as, as a gas um, because liquid hydrogen um, tankers are, are not yet um, out there um, that, that can um, move around the oceans um, and the pipelines are not refurbished to hydrogen yet to import it. So that's why we, I would expect that the first auctions will probably go in the direction of ammonia, maybe methanol. Um, we could also imagine that something like um, products for for the for the mineral oil industry to make jet fuel and these things could be could be some of the commodities in the early rounds. 
Okay, thank you. Um, Gavin Blake, um, I think we mentioned Gavin earlier, um, Byrne Wallace Law Firm here in Dublin, asked an interesting question, which is kind of puts it onto a, a broader global um, level, which some of you have already touched on. Um, obviously, we're talking from the point of view of Europe, but Gavin says, does the panel feel that the successful future deployment of green hydrogen could be reliant on China getting fully behind it? and driving down the cost of electrolyzers in a similar fashion to how it contributed to bringing down the cost of solar PV. So would China be the, whatever, the game changer? Is that, is that, is that a possibility? Um, do you want to have a crack at that, Shiva? What's your sense of? <laughs> no, I just, uh, I was, I mean, I, of course, I think anything that can drive the price down is, yeah. is going to be important. Having said that, I guess from an maybe EU uh, perspective let's also hope that we learn from perhaps the past and you know let's try to keep some of the technology solutions in europe and i mean as you know certainly on the pv manufacturing you know europe unfortunately did lose out uh, in that <laughs> in that situation um so Yes, I mean, I would certainly say, I mean, we have some really excellent energy um, hydrogen solution technologies that are being right now developed in Europe. I think it'd be excellent if they have good access to global markets. Um, and I think this is therefore the role of the European Union and certainly the role of the EI Bank to ensure that, you know, it's not the financing that may drive them away from Europe in order to, you know, keep them grow and scale up as companies in Europe and have that technology also be very much available in Europe. Uh, but yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think China brings scale. China is an important, um, has invested the most in renewable energy of the last uh, how many years? So in, indeed, they will play an important role. I'm going to just stay with you, Shiva, and I promise I'm not drawing you into the politics, but Brexit is something that we're, you know, we're, 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 we're conscious of. Don't worry, I'm not going to go into the detail of, of that. It's more just the broader question of whether Aidan McGurk is here, and he says, he's wondering whether you think Brexit might present, but let's, let's call it the post-Brexit situation that we're in, rather than Brexit itself. So we're now in a new world where we have Brexit. So Aidan McGurk is wondering whether that might present problems for British and Northern Irish companies accessing finance from EIB for hydrogen projects? I mean, again, there needs to be some more uh, political agreements between the EU and obviously the UK uh, on these things. But I would say generally, if their investments are in, again, in, in, in territories where we have these agreements or so EU or elsewhere, those are eligible. So let's say a company you know, wants to invest in a, in a project in France, Germany, anywhere in the EU, or indeed in countries outside of the EU where there is a framework agreement, that is okay. Um, you know, I think anything that is right now specifically for investments into the UK, we're still waiting for some of these agreements. I, I certainly hope that they, you know, that these agreements come in place. Um, so until then, I think we need to just see how we can support the companies maybe for their investments outside. Thanks for that. Uh, Joseph Commons has a very interesting uh, comment and question. He says that this has been a very useful uh, session and we all agree with him on that. The focus has understandably been on supply side preparedness. And in the first instance, the demand side is focused on the transport sector. What would the panel have views on stimulating demand in industry or electricity sectors? Do other countries foresee, quote unquote, directing hydrogen to those hard to carbonize areas, such as high temperature requirements, steel production, and so on? Or is a more market-based approach allowing demand to emerge where consumers are willing to pay a premium? Would that market-based approach be preferable? Um, Isabel. Well, uh, that level, uh, what happens is we have a carbon tax and uh, that uh, in a way, is a motivation for industry to, to go into other options. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually, uh, for instance, cement industry has, uh, uh, as you know, high levels of CO2 emissions, and uh, there is a motivation to reduce this substantially. And uh, 
is actually making an effort and I have contacts uh, to, for introducing hydrogen into the combustion system to decrease the level of CO2 production. Uh, along with other sectors. I mean, we've been discussing that uh, and uh, I, I think there is a, a very good potential to have them shifting to hydrogen. Uh, at the beginning, not fully, and, but uh, uh, I mean, because even uh, you need some uh, other materials to to be combusted and uh, uh, but uh, i'm sure that with uh, uh, past combustion i mean specific systems at uh, the beginning and then with the ex experience we get from there we develop new burners and so on and that's why i think it's very important to work with industry and uh, at least uh, industries in Portugal is motivated to that, to change their system and to have some small pilots to see how it works and economic works too, and uh, to have uh, bigger projects. And I, I, I think it's, it's a good way to go with pilots and then to drive into mm -hmm. other projects. But yes. Fran, yeah, that's, thank you for that. France, this, Okay, the question of tension between our question between stimulating, you know, proactively pushing into or directing into new areas or, or allowing the market perhaps to find the level that it, you might expect it to find. Yeah, as I, as I touched upon in, in my talk, it's, it's, yes, did, it's yes. also a very debated topic in Germany um, mm. because of the notion of having limited amounts in the beginning. Uh, in contrast to that, uh, the premium for using it in transport is something you might want to use in the beginning because that, that makes it easier to reach some competitiveness. So there are different views on this topic, I would say. So there's no, no real consensus in Germany on it right now where you should start from. <laughs> yeah. Shiva, I will give you, I'm afraid, what will have to be the last word because oh, no. we've gone way over time here. So oh, I saw okay, you nodding sorry. your head at one point. So No, sorry, Alex. I just want to say that yeah. um, I recently read a study where uh, the premium on a car that was made with green steel for a consumer was, I don't know, 40, 50 euros more. And if you therefore look at it from a whole value chain perspective, you know, maybe indeed we should be stimulating demand by the end customer for green cars with green steel, because that's what would incentivize the steel manufacturers to provide the green steel to a car, you know, manufacturer. So, I mean, I'm just putting that last thought out. Sure. Yeah, yeah, no, no, interesting. Um, very interesting, as indeed all of the contributions have been. And I'm only sorry that we've run out of time, um, but these things have to stop sometime and people have other things to do, including, I'm sure, our speakers. I want to thank each one of um, each one of them, uh, each one of the three of you for um, the generosity you've shown in terms of the time that you gave, the preparation of the uh, presentations and also your willingness to uh, to deal with and to answer questions and engage with our audience. It's been a really, really stimulating uh, session. So thank you once again. And I hope in the future we'll see um, one or all of you um, in, in this, you know, continuing a uh, debate uh, that, that, that we're having. And um, thank you um, for viewing this um, seminar, this webinar uh, this afternoon. Uh, thank you for all your support. Thanks again to the ESB. And I'm sure we'll see you again before too long. Good afternoon. <laughs>